Okay, so <clears throat> first of all, um, just what we're gonna, what I'm gonna do here is recap what um, some of the stuff that we went over yesterday, because I want to make sure that that we are understanding the difference between a projection and a position, body position. So I'm gonna read out of the Bond Traeger. I'm on page 19. It says that a projection is a positioning term that describes the direction or path of the CR of the X-ray beam as it passes through the patient, projecting an image onto the image receptor. Um, so for example, this first picture that we're looking at, we're going to, um, we had said yesterday that again, we're paying attention to the central ray and here the central ray, I'm gonna to try to see if I get my marker. And here it is. That didn't work. It's entering the body in the AP aspect of the body or anterior, I should say, the anterior and it exits the posterior. So this one is going to be an AP. Again, all we're doing is describing the path of the central ray. In the second picture, because it's going in posterior, this is a posterior aspect of the patient, then and exiting the anterior, then this becomes a PA, posterior anterior projection. So again, describing the projection, the path of how X-ray travels through the patient. This is an anterior posterior, and the second picture is posterior anterior. All right, so this one here, um, that we were talking about yesterday. Now we're talking about the obliques. Again, when we talk about obliques, obliques um, is, is going to indicate um, the, the position of the anatomy that it is rotated. Anytime we rotate an anatomical body part, uh, we're going to use the term oblique. In this case, we're using the term oblique because we're not using, um, the, the, sorry, the plane that we're using is the oblique plane, right? So in this slide here, we needed to first identify which one is my AP and which one is my PA oblique. Well, the top of the foot we said was dorsal and that's the top of the foot. That'd be AP. The bottom of the foot would be plantar. So because <clears throat> the <clears throat> excuse me, because the central ray is traveling uh, from the anterior part of the foot to the posterior side of the foot or the plantar side of the foot, we're going to call this the anterior posterior oblique. And then we said that because the foot is being rotated this way towards the big toe, the big toe is considered the medial, or this side of the foot by the big toe is considered the medial aspect, while the side of the small um, digit over here is considered the lateral aspect. So because we're rotating it towards the medial, this becomes a medial oblique an AP medial oblique of the foot. This one here, we said that this is the dorsum manus. This is the posterior side of the hand. The palm side is considered anterior. Then we also said that the thumb, my patient in the anatomical position, the, the thumb or the first digit is lateral, the fifth digit is medial. So the rotation here is towards the lateral rotation 
or towards the lateral side. So this is a PA oblique. And we say it's a lateral oblique because we're rotating it, rotating it towards the thumb, right? Or the first digit here. And again, it doesn't matter which way you, you turn the hand. You have to think of the, of, the, of the hand in its anatomical position. Anatomically position, the first digit is always lateral. And the fifth digit, this, the pinky, is in the medial part or medial aspect. Again, looking at a lateral projection. On the lateral projections, we cannot say that it's either AP or PA because we're not entering that anatomical area, anterior or posterior. We're entering the anatomical area or the body part laterally. Lateral, we said, remember, was anything that is 90 degrees. I'm going to write it up here. 90 degrees. So anything that's 90 degrees makes anything a lateral. Anything away from 90 degrees, like let's say 20 degrees, 30 degrees, 40 degrees, 70 degrees, would be considered oblique because we're just rotating the patient. 90 degrees will put any anatomical part lateral, a true lateral. So this is a lateral projection. And now we need to describe um, how the central ray is traveling through the body. So again, look at the first digit here. This tells me that this is lateral. The fifth digit is down here, and that would be medial. So then this is a lateral medial projection of the hand. On the foot, again, this would be medial because remember the big toe is medial. And the fifth digit down here and all of this side is considered lateral. So then this becomes a medial lateral projection because again, we're describing how the central ray is traveling through this ankle. In this case, it's traveling from medial to lateral. These here again are just body positions. And we went over this yesterday. Both of these patients we said could be um, identified as recumbent. Recumbent is just having the patient in a lying position, uh, lying down in any position <clears throat> this first picture here, number one, she is supine. She is lying on her back. Picture number two, we say that she is prone, lying on her abdomen, facing down, downward. Again, I'm going to put this one as one. This one is two. And for this patient, the legs are elevated higher than the head. And so she is in the recumbent position with the body tilted with the head uh, lower than the feet. So this one is a Trendelenburg. Trendelenburg. Picture number two, this patient has her head tilted with the head higher than the feet. So this is the Fowler's position. So number one, Trendelenburg, number two, Fowler's. And again, remember I told you that we may not have this fancy equipment to tilt the table, but these positions can, can, e can easily be acquired with us placing pillows underneath the feet to make the, to raise the feet higher than the head or pillows or blankets or whatever to raise the head, elevate the head to be higher 
than the fee. Again, we're looking at positions. We're not looking at projections. On this one, on general body positions, both of these we're gonna say are laterals because both of them are turning at a 90 degree. They are in a complete lateral, even though she looks a little bit rotated here, but I think it's just the way the, the camera is angled at her. And next we need to identify what side is closest to the image receptor. In this case, it is her right side. So then we would identify this one as a right lateral. This right lateral can be either erect, like the way she is, or it could be with her um, lying down on her right side. It would still be a lateral position. The second picture over here, this is a patient lying down on their left side. So then this would be a left lateral. These other positions, um, you do need to be aware of them because uh, depending on the type of facility that you're going to be at, um, if you're at a family practice, um, this may be a position that the doctor may have you position the patient for a rectal exam. And rectal exams are not uncommon. Um, they can be performed by a family doctor, family practitioner, uh, especially when there's history of um, previous his, or history on that patient that may require the doctor to do a rectal exam. This one here is called a SIMS uh, position. The one that you're seeing here is a modified SIMS. The regular SIMS position, the patient is recumbent oblique position with the patient lying on their left anterior side with the right knee and the thigh flexed and the left arm extended down behind the back. This one here is a modified SIMS. As you can see, her arm over here on the regular um, SIMS position, we would actually see her arm over here and she'd be more facing down towards the table, like more on her abdomen. This one is a modified SIMS She's almost at a 90 degree here. She's still rotated somewhat forward. This is her right leg. This is her left leg. And her right leg is still crossed over. Uh, and the knee is flexed over here. And these, this type of um, body position, the modified SIMS, is used for rectal um, exams and also can be used for um, barium studies when they have to insert an enema tip. Again, this one here is just showing you that this patient is erect. Remember, erect just means that the patient is in the upright position, standing or sitting up on a chair it could also be uh, erect or upright. patient is in the recumbent. So this be a recumbent lateral, this one here. Okay, um, this one here is your oblique posi positions. Again, when we talk about position, we're describing uh, a, a we're, we're being very specific as to uh, the way the patient is positioned for a particular projection, right? So this is an anterior projection, right? Because this is, this, we're talking about the path of the central ray. This is a, whoops, let me get back over here. This is the anterior 
part of it, of the body. And then you have the posterior behind it. And I also need to identify that this is um, right side and this is the left. So again, on this one, we're looking at positions. We're not looking at projections. So what, and then we need to select the side that is closest to the image receptor back here. This is your image receptor. So I'm going to start off with this one like we did yesterday. This is the left side is closest to the image receptor. Now we need to identify, is it his posterior side or his anterior side closest to the image receptor? Well, in this case, it's his posterior side that's closest, right? Because the back side of him is touching the image receptor. And then this would be an oblique because we already know that he's rotated. He's not at 90 degrees, he's just rotated. So we're going to identify this one as an LPO because his left side, posterior aspect of the body is touching the IR and it's an oblique. If we look at this patient down here, picture number two, Again, I have to identify first um, right and left. So this is her right. Down here is her left or on the other side. So again, she's lying down on her left side. This is your image receptor right here. She's lying down on her left side well, which side? Is it her anterior or her posterior? It is her posterior. So both picture number one and picture number two are identifying left posterior oblique. So the same thing this guy's doing up here, the same thing she's doing down here, except this is in the supine position or recumbent, I'm gonna say recumbent position. Now we look at this um, patient. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this as number three. This is number four. Again, I'm going to identify the sides first. So this is my right side and this is my left side. By looking at this picture, I'm gonna put my R here. Again, the next question, which side is closest? The right side. Which side is touching the image receptor? The anterior side. And it's an oblique. So then we can refer to this one as a right anterior oblique. Same thing with this patient. She's in a recumbent position. This is her left and this is her right. What side is closest to the image receptor? her right side, is it her posterior or anterior? In this case, it would be her anterior. Oops, that's supposed to be an A. And again, we know that she's oblique. So both of these are RAOs. And again, I can turn in the opposite direction. I put the left side and that would be the left anterior oblique. All right, so I did get to lecture on some of this to some of you. I think the first group, the second group didn't quite get um, lectured on it. Let me see if I can grab. My text here. Maybe not. Well, here we 
here we go. Okay, so these projections here are called decubitus or decubitus position. A decubitus, we said, what makes it a decubitus is that the patient is lying down on a horizontal surface, first of all. So I'm gonna put it here, patient is Patient is lying down on a horizontal surface. All right, that's that's for decubitus. And you can see there, she's lying down on a gurney or on an x-ray table, right? And that's horizontally. Then it also says that um, the central ray is also horizontal. And I'll show you what we mean by that. This position is done to view air and fluid levels. And in parentheses, I'm gonna put abdomen or chest. Most commonly, from my, from my, in my case, has been the chest, where we do um, where we do decubitus. I'm trying to move this block. All right, my apologies, because I thought I had it on black. Oh well. In this case, we had said that the x-ray is no longer coming from the top. So in most cases, our x-ray tube would be right here, right? We have our knobs and so forth. And the x-ray would be shooting this way. That's not what we're saying here. What we're saying here is that the x-ray is actually coming in this way. And some x-ray tubes are allowed. We can move them all over the place. So this is our x-ray tube here. And again, I'm just sort of exaggerating here. But this is our x-ray tube and it's shooting this x-ray horizontally towards the long axis of the body, this is the long axis of the body. And this is the short axis of the body. So my patient is lying down on a horizontal surface. This is a horizontal surface, which is the table. This position is done to view, um, sorry. And then the central ray is also horizontal, right? It's coming at the same direction as a patient horizontally. Uh, and again, this position is done to view air and fluid levels. Because a central ray is entering in the anterior part of it, right? So we can say that this is an uh, anterior and exiting posteriorly. Remember, because I, I told you that whenever we identify projection and my patient, even though she's at 90 degrees, but I'm not shooting the x-ray from the top, I'm shooting at a horizontal beam, right? It's entering her horizontally. So it's actually entering in her anterior and exiting posterior, because look at this, this is her image receptor back here. So if I wanted to describe the, pro the projection would be an anterior posterior projection, decubitus. Decubitus is going to identify position, not projection. 
would be turning facing away from us like this guy. And this would still be a decubitus. Be why? Because again, he's on a horizontal surface and the X-ray is coming at a horizontal, horizontal beam. And decubitus, I said, helps us to identify fluid or air, air or fluid levels in these cavities. If you have pneumonia and you have fluid in the lungs, we would begin to see, and I'm gonna, again, just exaggerate. We would be able to see fluid in the um, right, because this is the right side. We would see fluid on the right side because fluid always goes down and air goes up. If I'm looking for free air up here, then I would see on the left side, on the left lung, this happens because of trauma. Then I would still do the same position, a right lateral decubitus, but it wouldn't be to look at my right lung. It'd be, it'd be so that I can look at the left, this is your left side, the left lung. And those were considered, we said lateral. These are lateral decubitus. So she's lying on her, this is her left side. This is her right side. So we can say that this is a, a left lateral decubitus for her, picture number one. Picture number two, he's lying down on his right side. So this is a right lateral decubitus. I'm going to clear these drawings. Okay, again, these are also decubitus, but now we're using the term dorsal and ventral. Dorsal is posterior, right? Ventral means anterior. So again, patient is lying down on a horizontal surface and the X-ray is still coming from over here. It's not coming from the top, right? We're used to seeing the X-ray tube up here and then shooting X-rays down here. That's not what we're doing with decubitus. In decubitus, the X-ray is coming in from the side and we're shooting this way. That's what makes a decubitus, a horizontal, horizontally. And we're always going to describe the position by what is closest to the table. For example, this guy is lying down on his back. This is his dorsal and this is his ventral. We don't refer to it as anterior or posterior. So this would be a dorsal decubitus position. And because his uh, left side is closest to the image receptor, we say that this is a left dorsal decubitus. left dorsal decubitus. This guy over here, which is the same patient, but he's now in the prone position. This is dorsal and this is anterior. So the anterior is down. So the downside, we're describing the downside to the horizontal surface. So then this is, sorry, ventral. I'm using the wrong term here. This is ventral. So then this one would be a ventral decubitus. And we would say that his right side is closest to the image receptor. This is the image receptor back here. 
So this would be right ventral decubitus. Ventral because he's on his stomach, on his abdomen, face down. He's prone. So the side that is down is what gets mentioned or identified. All right. This next part here, let me undo that one. Let me clear all my drawings. There we go. We're entering into the part of additional special use projection terms. Uh, we're going to look at this first one is called an axial projection. And an axial refers to the long axis of a structure or part. Uh, we use this um, for special views that, that, that we do. Um, and not necessarily special views, but even your, some of our typical views that require us to angle the X-ray tube, the central ray of 10 degrees or more along the long axis of the body or body part. So let's identify first again. This is the long axis of the body or we're gonna say the long axis of the head, right? And then this other part would be the short axis because it's shorter from here to here and longer from here to here. I'm gonna pretend that over here is our X-ray tube. They didn't take a picture of it, but we're gonna pretend that we do. Our X-ray tubes angle, allow us to angle. Again, I'm going to pretend like this is an x-ray tube. And what we're saying is that on the axial, any time that we're going to angle more on the, uh, any angle of the central ray of 10 degrees or more, called an axial. In this case, not only is, is it an axial projection, now we need to identify is it going is it going in anteriorly or is it entering posteriorly? Because remember now we're we're back to we're back to projection. This is anterior the front of the head, and this is posterior. So if this arrow indicates that this is our x-ray, it enters anterior and exits posterior. So that's why they're calling it an AP axial projection. So what makes it an axial, again, is that I'm angling the x-ray, the central ray, 10 degrees or more. In this case, it's giving us here the number of 37. So they've angled 37 degrees. Here in this picture number two, I'm gonna name it number two. It's coming in at an angle and that makes it an axial, remember, because it's more than 10 degrees. Except in her case, this would be the top of her head would be superior, I'm gonna put an S, and then the bottom of her chin or down here would be inferior. So this axial projection is more than 10 degrees, but is entering in the superior aspect and exiting inferiorly. So this, this projection itself would be an axial superior inferior. Again, we're describing the path of the central ray. The path of the central ray because it's a projection. So my central ray is entering more than 10 degrees here. And I'm gonna draw the X-ray tube here so we can see, make sense of it. So 
So this is my x-ray tube and it's angled. Something like that. And it's entering superiorly and exiting inferiorly. So this would be an axial superior inferior projection. Okay, again, on this one, I'm entering at an angle. This is my x-ray tube over here, down here. Remember, this is very similar to my decubitus because you may say, well, this is coming in horizontally. Well, it really is not because it's coming in at an angle. See this pointer here is coming in this way and there's an angle. There's an angle here and another angle here. So in this one, we're going to say that this is the inferior part of her auxilla or armpit. The top of the shoulder is superior. So this is gonna be the opposite from the picture we just saw. This would be an axial, let me put it on here. This would be an axial inferior superior projection because that's how it's entering, the inferior and exiting superior. This one here, this next projection is called a tangential projection. And a tangential projection, and I'm gonna type it on here. It's going to mean that um, touching a curve or surface, oops. at only one point. And the picture they put on here is of a skull and it's a tangential um, projection of what we call zygomatic arches or in easier terms, the cheekbone. Um, I don't like this example, but that's what we have. In your book, you also have one where, um, I don't know if I have it on here. Let me make sure. No. I don't know what it did to my picture, but it deleted it. Tangential projections, again, they're only touching a curve or surface at only one point. So, let me see if I can draw it on here. Let's pretend that this is my patient here. And they're lying down recumbent, facing up. And they have their knees bent on the table. These are their feet over here. Okay. Now in the knees, we have uh, some small bones, right? That are called patellas on both knees. We have one on each side. In order for me to take an x-ray of that patella bone, because we need to rule out a fracture or whatever it may be, I need to perform what we call a tangential projection. I'm trying to, I'm going to position the patient similar to this, what I've drawn. My x-ray tube will be over here. Okay, this is my x-ray tube. And 
again, if I'm only touching a curve or surface with the central ray, that means that I'm shooting the X-ray to point to that particular uh, kneecap. And at the end, you'll see the um, tibia like this. And then you'll see the patella bone up here like this. So it's not, there's nothing blocking it. And this is called a tangential, tangential projection. We can talk about this some more when we get you into class. All right, let's move on. This one here is called a, and I'm going to type it on here. A, whoops, a lardotic projection. Well, they have it down as an AP lordotic projection because it's entering. You remember, it's entering the anterior aspect of the body and exiting posterior. This projection here is specific to the chest. We're not gonna do this for any, any other body part except for the chest. And um, we do this specific to the chest to view the apices of the lungs, which is a very top part of the lungs. And in this case, um, you're going to notice in your textbooks that they use a term axial, uh, AP axial projection. It is axial because in this case, the x-ray tube is over here and let me let me see if i can draw it the, the x-ray tube is here and it's going in perpendicular there's no angle to it but as you can tell he's not standing straight so from here to here there's like a 20 degree Remember, anything that's more than 10 degrees is considered axial. So even though he's not, even though the central ray is not angled, he, the patient is angled. So that sort of compensates for that angulation. So this becomes an AP axial or axial AP lordotic projection. And again, this only applies to the chest, not anything else. Alrighty, this one here can be a little bit confusing because she's also standing in the lateral position. But what makes it different is that in a lateral position, your patient is 90 degrees. In this case, she is turned at at 90 degrees, but she has one arm down by her side and she has one arm that has that is abducted and has her hand um, above her head. So this projection here is called a trans thoracic projection. Trans thoracic projection. Um, and you can either do a right or a left lateral on these. And the side again that is closest 
the image receptor is what gets um, demonstrated. And this is to look uh, specifically, put this on here, you can write this on there. This is done specifically for shoulders. And I'm going to put when trauma is present. And it's referred to as transthoracic because as you can see, here's the x-ray tube over here. We're shooting the x-ray perpendicular. It's going towards the body. And it has to pass through the thoracic cavity in order to get to the shoulder over here. So that's why we call it a trans, because it's going through thoracic to demonstrate that shoulder on the right side. If I turn her the opposite direction and bring her left arm down and her right and abduct her right arm, then it'd be a left transthoracic. And again, specifically for shoulders when trauma is present. So when, when we have a patient that has a, an obvious fracture of the humerus, we'll do this projection so that we won't have to, because we need two projections, remember, AP and lateral. In this case, um, we can't do a lateral because we don't want to move the arm. So this is the next best thing that we can do is a transthoracic. All right, so in this one here, again, we're, we came back to the feet. We're either going to do a dorsal plantar or a plantar dorsal projection. Um, just trying to find, yeah. So on this one, again, this is dorsal and this is plantar, the bottom of the foot. So then this one would be a, we said it was a dorsal plantar projection of the foot. And again, we're describing how the x-ray is traveling from, from the dorsal part to the plantar surface. In this x-ray over here, x-ray number two, this one is going to be called an axial plantar dorsal projection. Why? Because here is your x-ray tube. Well, let me try to do that again because that didn't come up. This is the x-ray tube. It's coming in at an angle. In this case, I think it's about 45 degrees if I'm not mistaken. So that's more than 10 degrees. So it makes it axial. And again, this is the long axis of the foot. So because it's coming more than 10 degrees, automatically it makes it an axial projection. But we're entering in the plantar part and it's exiting dorsal. So this is plantar dorsal dorsal plantar, axial plantar dorsal. All these here are unique projections. Um, and I'm going to identify these really quick because they go, these are given um, sometimes by the location of where the central ray is entering. And these are specific to skull. So when you get into this mod, you're going to probably repeat a lot of this stuff, but it's best that you grasp some of this information now. 
Okay, so on the top of the head, we have um, two bones on each side, and they're called parietal bones. Uh, I don't like that. Let me undo it here so I can do it in a color that you can see. Parietal. On the front of the face, where it's pointing right here, that's called the acanthus. Whoops, I'm going to make this in black. Okay. So remember, we're still talking about how the x-ray is traveling. So here's my x-ray tube. So this, this one in particular is coming in at um, perpendicular and it's coming in first to the parietal area. Again, here the parietals, if I were to get, grab her skull, there's one here and then there's one here. <clears throat> That's like the top of the head. And the x-ray is traveling through her head and exiting, sorry, my line is crooked, but exiting the acanthial part or the acanthus. So this projection we're going to call the parietal, whoops, acanthus, I can't type, projection. On this picture where you see the acanthus, and the acanthus is just, it's not a, it's not an anatomical part, that is just a landmark that we use. We, we're gonna be learning about different landmarks when you get into um, the skull. So the acanthus is between the nose and the lips. And this x-ray, I don't know if you can see it, but you can see the shadow of it. The x-ray is gonna enter into the acanthus and travel and exit the parietals. So this one is gonna be the opposite. This one is going to be the acanthial parietal projection. Acanthial parietal projection. Now, picture number three, which is down here. This is the top of her head is considered the vertex. So the top of your head is considered a landmark called the vertex. Down here, this is your mentum or mental point, or I'm drawing that little point. Below that, we use a term submental. Let me type that in. Submental, meaning below the mentum. So again, if I had to describe my central ray, here's my central ray. Entering there and exiting here, then I can call this one uh, the sub mental vertical oops, vertical projection or in short we can call that the SMV submental vertical so 
So it's entering and then exiting. Because again, this is a projections that we're looking at. All right, this is the one that we had gone over um, in relationship terms. Remember I told you about the medial aspect of the body and then the lateral aspect of the body here. This would be lateral. Anything at, towards the center is what we con consider the medial. We're not talking about body planes at this point. We're just talking about relationship terms. So if, I, if we look at um, the arm, we would say that this side of the forearm is lateral, but the inside of our forearm is medial. On our hand, this is lateral and this is medial. And by the way, he is standing in the anatomical position. If I were to look at his legs down here, the inside of his legs would be medial. The outside of his legs would be lateral. Then we also have the terms proximal versus distal. Distal is anything that's away from the body. Proximal is what is closest to the body. So if we could compare, we would say that the phalanges are distal, and I'm gonna say that the wrist is proximal. If I were to circle the elbow and compare it to the wrist, the elbow is proximal in comparison to the wrist. The wrist is now distal. Now I'm gonna circle the shoulder girdle. Then we could say that the shoulder in comparison to the elbow, the shoulder girdle is proximal, the elbow is distal. All right, so whenever we have to angle our x-ray tube for axial projections, we need to know or follow instructions, which direction am I going to angle? So remember I told you that your Bontrager books are very similar to what you would follow on a recipe, right? We need to be given instructions for everything that we're doing and we need to follow them. If I'm going to, and again, this is the long axis of the body, long axis of the body. When I'm, when I'm, ref when I'm looking at this picture, this is the x-ray tube right here, right? Something like that. And the x-rays are coming. If I'm pointing anything towards her feet down, this is going to be caudad. Also, we could refer to it as caudal. We're going to angle the CR caudally or in a caudad angle. If I'm pointing the central ray, here's a, my x-ray tube, and I'm pointing my x-ray towards the head, then I will call that a cephalid angle. So it's either caudad or cephalid. So this one here, we're gonna say that it's um, caudad because it's pointing towards her feet. This one on the other hand is pointing towards her head. We wanna call that cephalid.
then you also have, whoops, let me clear this up. Then you also have uh, relationship terms, super, superficial versus deep. So superficial, we're gonna say the epidermis or the dermis, I'm sorry, is superficial. The humerus bone, which is where it's pointing at, would be considered deep. Then you also have other terms. Um, you can use the terms um, exterior or external or outer would still be superficial. If I'm looking at the humerus, I can refer to that as deep. I can refer to that as internal, inside, within, right? Um, if I'm looking at these blood vessels here, the red ones are arteries, the blue are veins. I could say that these arteries are superficial versus these deep veins. All right, now we're gonna look at movements because Bontrager is gonna tell us how to move the body part in order to position it correctly. We have the terms flexion versus extension and you can see there, when I bend my knee, I'm flexing my knee. If I bend my elbow, right, like I'm gonna show off my biceps, that's flexion. Extension is straightening out your leg or straightening out your arm. Then we have terms like hyperextension or flexion. Most of the time we don't even say the term hyperextension, we just say extension. But our necks uh, or cervical spines uh, normally have a neutral extension, right? We walk with our heads up, we don't walk with our heads down. Um, but in some cases, when we want to x-ray the cervical spine or the lumbar spine, you're going to be um, told that you need to flex, that's to bring forward, or you need to hyperextend it, that's to bring back. Here's another movement that belongs to um, like the hand here. You have hyperextension or dorsiflexion, because remember the, the, the posterior part of the hand is dor, uh, dorsomanus. Uh, so you have hyperextension or dorsiflexion, and that's when you grab your, your fingers and you pull them back, right? You can straighten out your hand. Acute flexion means that you're going to rest your hand on a hard surface and really extend the or I'm sorry, flex the wrist joint um, on a hard surface. That's called acute flexion. We use these for special views of hands and wrists. Then you also have radial versus ulnar deviation. So if I, if you place your hand flat on a surface and you move it towards the the thumb, the 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 first digit, that's called a radio devi deviation. And if you look at this picture closely, the first digit, this is digit number one, this is your thumb, correlates to the radius. So when your hand is moving this way, we call that radio deviation. If you look at your fifth digit, this is your pinky, correlates to the ulna. So when we have your hand moving that way, then we call that ulnar deviation. Our foot, if we, if you can sit back on a chair and point your toes down, ooh, let me erase this, sorry.
on the foot, if you point your toes down, that's plantar flexion. If you point your toes up, we call that dorsiflexion. And sometimes um, on certain uh, x-rays, it'll say dorsiflex the foot or do a plantar flexion on the foot. These are called stress movements of the ankle joint. And you have two. One is um, eversion, and that's away from the body, which is this first one here. Let me put that as number one. So this one is eversion. I don't know why the names are not in there, but let's type it in. Eversion, and that's turning your ankle away from your body, right? And then this other one would be inversion, which is what happens when we sprain our ankle, right? Most of the time our, our foot would go in this way, causing that ligament to, to um, be swollen because we've Ex overextended that ligament. But we do have special views that we do for that particular ligament. And so we have to do, e we, we're going to either evert the foot, the ankle, or we're going to do an inversion of the ankle. This next one, again, if you were to um, use your arm as an example, you can do a medial versus lateral rotation, right? Remember, medial is towards the body. Lateral is away from the body. So we have medial rotation and then lateral rotation. We use these movements for shoulder x-rays. So you got to understand when the book tells you do a lateral rotation of the shoulder or do a medial rotation of the shoulder for proper positioning. Abduction versus adduction. So we, whenever we move our arm away from the body, that's abduction. We can do the same thing with our legs. We can abduct the leg. That means spread open that leg, whether it be the left or the right. Adduction means that we're gonna to bring towards the body. So you may, you will run across these two terms when it says abduct the, the arm to 90 degrees. That means move away, uh, move, bring that arm and move it away 90 degrees. We had gone over this one, supination versus pronation. Pronate the hand means to palms down. Supination means to, to place the dorsum manus on the surface means that you're going to uh, palms up. This next one is protraction versus retraction. Protraction means that we move the mandible forward. Retraction is that we move it back, right? So, um, and this would probably be more towards skull x-rays or facial x-rays that would have you uh, use these terms for positioning. Uh, this other one, elevation versus depression. So in certain x-rays, we have to depress the shoulders, ask the patient to relax, and we, we sometimes give the patient weights to bring the shoulders down. That's called depressing the shoulders. Elevation, really obvious, we elevate the shoulders, we bring them up. Circumduction movements, again, we can do that with our legs and that's just moving the limbs in circular motion. And that would be circumduction. This one here is rotation versus tilt, right? Uh, when we rotate our heads, you can think of it as um, mm, when we say no and we move our heads back and forth, that's rotation. 
when I tilt my head, I'm gonna draw, this would be tilting here. And this one would be rotation here. These two rotation and tilting um, are important uh, during the mod when you take skull, because these are the two common mistakes that that people or technicians or technologists, sorry, uh, do when we're performing X-rays of the head. We either have rotation or we have tilt, and we shouldn't have either one. And there's ways to correct that. All right, I'm gonna stop here for now. I'm going to be sending out another video and we'll probably lecture some more uh, next week on the, um, the section for uh, viewing radiographs or radiographic viewing. Uh, and then some of these uh, key uh, requirements for uh, performing x-rays because you know just like photography we take pictures of bones and we want to make sure that we always give the best presentation that we can when we do x-rays of our patients so we'll talk about that some more in my next video thank you